Um, I, I'll tell you about one of the, the sort of long-term projects that um, I, I'm particularly interested in. And for me, this is a sort of post-Kemble thing. So it, it, it's how would you use this Kemble data to further change? How will you organize bioactivity data in a way to further improve um, drug discovery? And this, this, this work started at EBI. Um, uh, did some work um, primarily with Magda, that uh, was Vina at um, Benevolent AI. Uh, and then um, came here to the MDC and, and continuing it. And, and so it's a long-term, long-term uh, thing. And, and for a little bit of context, I guess, you know, I, I was really interested, one of my favorite books actually is, is um, a book by Walter Sneeder, Drug Prototypes and Their Exploitation. And it's a really good history of both drugs, um, how they were discovered, but also how we discovered them, what techniques we used. So, the earliest assays in drug discovery, I guess, were direct experiments in humans. Um, you know, we tried some stuff or, or people forced other humans to swallow things or, or have it rubbed onto their body or something. Um, and it was it was clearly you know, error prone. Probably a lot of people suffered from the sort of experiments that they they did. But but occasionally we came across some useful medicines, things like aspirin, quinine, arguably artemisinin um, and so forth. Um, you know, the, the primarily natural products discovered from empirical stochastic screening in, in a human population. And it took a long time, an awful long time, to make things a little bit more rational, to switch into animal models of disease as your primary screening platform. And there's companies um, uh, today like Melio Discovery that still do this. They, they do repurposing studies and screening studies directly in mouse models of, of disease. Um, one of the issues, I guess, is that they're faster and safer and cheaper, but they're less predictive. There's, there's a sort of fidelity gap that emerges as you move away from the, the experiment in humans. Uh, you can probably see where this is going from the, from the slide. Um, a little bit later, um, arguably in the early parts of the 20th century, um, scientists started to realize that isolated tissues and organs and, and blood and so forth were useful for drug discovery as well. So ex vivo assays, higher throughput, cheaper, um, gave mechanistic insights, but less predictive. But of course, the actives in a tissue-based um, assay needed to be tested in animal models and then move on to um, human clinical trials. Cell lines came along, a transformative technology. Uh, we've all heard about HeLa and HEC and CACO and, and so forth. Um, less predictive, higher throughput and cheaper. Uh, and then, um, you know, the, the, the expression, I, I can't remember the word, what, what hits the fan, but something hit the fan in the 1970s and 80s, and that was really recombinant DNA technology and compound collections and so forth. And this gave us the ability to screen essentially at a biochemical assay at very large scale, um, but um, higher throughput, which is great, but, but again, lower fidelity. So I guess now most drug discovery programs have a sort of a series of assays between your primary HTS screen and a human clinical trial. And if you can't map a credible path to how you're going to score an assay compounds as you go from a, essentially a gene product through to a, a treatment for a human disease, you're probably up to no good in, in drug discovery. And I, I guess you know, I came to the realization we put in, in, in some of the very early days, some classification, some semantic classification of the assays in, in Kemble. Um, and of course, because dealing with um, proteins and, and to some degree cells is quite straightforward, focus there in terms of the curation. Um, with Kemble, one of the things I think we did, which, which was in hindsight a very good thing to do, was to try and capture all data, even though there weren't really ways of dealing with um, functional assays at the time. I think you know, some of the other fledgling resources that were started really focused on this target binding um, sort of components so biochemical assays, receptor you know, ligand displacement. And then th there's really nowhere to go in a translational sense. What, what are the assays that you use next? So yeah, there was a little bit of serendipity there. So anyway, one day was thinking uh, and started to get really interested in neural networks and, and how they work and, and so forth. And then you know, I came up with this, this um, sort of cartoon, uh, I was gonna say formalism, uh, but, but cartoons a better word, of you know, a network, a, a, a directed graph 
of assays spanning this biochemical or this bio, the, the natural order of biological organization. And this mirrors, in I think quite a nice way, the progression of a compound or the potential progression of a compound across this, this sort of net of assays. Um, of course, real drug discovery is a particular path or set of paths through this, this assay cascade. So almost every drug discovery program, you can think about taking an assay and then joining it up to a cell-based assay or a, um, a tissue-based an animal model and, and then onto a clinical trial. The drugs that have been discovered have almost by definition not miraculously been delivered as a human drug product, but they will have been tested in animal models or ex vivo models or, or whatever. So we can start to sort of build backwards these connection paths as well. So Kemble is a pretty good basis for starting to build some of the elements of this um, connected or this directed bioassay graph. For me, the, the, you know, one of the beautiful things about this was the potential of having in silico techniques that could augment um, or, or impute, you know, if, you, if you've got a whole bunch of kinase data, um, you can now take the sequence of another kinase and, and have a, a pretty good guess of what the inhibition profile would be. Um, so imputing uh, novel bioassay nodes um, here, I think is pretty interesting. And, and, and one of the, one of the, one of the, the sort of things I'd like to try is impute for every gene product of a um, of a uh, well human gene for every human gene product, um, you know, a believable or, or a, an agonist or inhibitor type assay, and try and ground it in this in this network. So it's a little bit abstract. This is a, a real example. So a COX two, um, you've got a compound you test in a biochemical assay. You establish its IC fifty. On the basis of that IC50 value, you make a decision, you push it forward to um, LPS stimulated THP1 cells, for example, and then stimulated whole blood, and then um, a treated uh, rat um, that indu well, induces an inflammatory response, and then you, you modify that. And then you could potentially, if all of these are active and safe and so forth, you, you can put it into a, a human clinical trial, in this case, for, for, for the pain from gout. To be clear, of course, there's another, this is, this is entirely to do with the efficacy of a compound. I guess there's another network, which is to do with safety pharmacology. Uh, the nice thing about safety pharmacology is that it's pretty static, or the type of experiments you do are pretty static for small molecules, and, and that you have a different network or, or, or screening cascade for, for RNA, techno RNA interference, RNA drugs, and so forth. But, but the, you know, to, to be clear, there's an efficacy um, bioassay network, and then there's a sort of uh, an admet um, uh, bioassay network as well. So a drug discovery program is just one path through these cells. Um, the, uh, we, we probably all know cases where um, you've got a compound that's active in, a, uh, in, in an animal model, you put it through to human clinical trials, um, and it turns out that the drug is useful for something else. The way that that is often validated is going back to an animal model. Um, and, and I'm starting to build a sort of review with the literature um, where I guess the majority of the described examples of drug repositioning have really been futzing about with some of the connections on this right-hand side of the graph, of this directed bioassay graph. Um, so experimental medicine, rep drug repurposing and things has primarily happened here. There's been few examples where people have regrounded a drug and then gone through, traced another path to get to that same disease. So just to give you an idea of the sort of flavors of the sort of algorithms or, or approaches that we, you know, that we see as possible from this. One of the other things, of course, is that you see convergent graphs. So multiple targets give rise to a cure for the same disease. But one of the things they do is they, I guess they capture the sort of concept of mechanism you know this this sort of seductive siren on the on the shores of of um, uh, yeah data mining and and yeah, knowledge graphs and so forth in in quite a, a, a rigorous way where you, where you see these nodes that are distinct but then converge what you have is is a, a mechanistic bifurcation at that point so over over the over the years probably you know seven eight years now um, built um, components to do most of this finding assays is quite straightforward text mining across papers, patents, vendor catalogs, 
um, indexing of assays, built some specialist dictionaries, um, covering things like techniques, equipment, genes, endpoints, you know, the, the classic, you know, drug target um, disease or phenotype as well. Classification of assays is really straightforward. Um, arguably, I guess there's an intermediate um, level of organization, but, but relatively little published data at the current time around organoids. So that so intermediates or maybe even replacements between you know a simple cell based um, a homogeneous cell based assay and a and a clinical trial or, or you know animal model for, for efficacy. Similarity of assays, you know, techniques like um, word to vec, doctor vec, whatever, um, are pretty good at finding similarities between blobs of text. The chaining of the assays, so building, you know, essentially going from an undirected graph to a directed graph. Again, it's quite straightforward using some very simple heuristics. Um, and, and also one of the other things which, which for me is really interesting is thinking about what, what are the sort of decision points that chemists take at one level of the, the network that make them progress to the next one. And, and another thing I, I should have said it when, when I was introducing stuff at the beginning is that the, um, the costs of the assays as you go through from the left-hand side, the biochemical assays to the right-hand side, grow by many orders of magnitude. You start off with something that's like 10 pence, 10 euros, 10 cents, whatever, on the left-hand side for a biochemical assay. Probably, you know, for an animal study, 10,000 to 100,000 currency units. And then for a clinical trial, 10 to 100 million um, currency units for, um, uh, for a, a sort of single bioassay data point there as well. So, so you've got this horrendous um, sort of uh, cost increase, and that really applies a lot of discipline discipline in the sort of experiments you can afford to fund, um, even for the deepest uh, pocketed companies. So the Kemble database um, you know, is just a, an old slide, but really makes the point that it links um, compounds through to uh, bioassays. But the nice thing is that from the same paper, all of the, the related bioassay data is, is captured. So here you've got a, a biochemical assay against an enzyme called thrombin involved in blood coagulation. And here you've got an in vivo assay. Um, so essentially the clotting time of, uh, of blood or the change in the clotting time of blood. So a functional assay linked through it to a target assay. And if the people were up to, or if the biology makes any sense, this is evidence of a link between those two processes and evidence of a link between two bioassays that are in some way coupled. It's easy to build um, uh, you know, complicated network diagrams from, um, uh, from data sources like Kemble and, and of course PubChem Bioassay and, and other derived uh, resources. Um, here, this is a subset of 100 approved drugs, just drawing out on the basis purely of the, the, the assay connections between the drugs some functional relationships, so kinase inhibitors, HDAX for epigenetic re regulation, anti-neoplastics, uh, sex hormones, um, uh, and, and enzymes that, that modify that um, down here in the, in, the, in the left. Obligatory hair diagram, just to show that these things sort of scale in, in, some, uh, in some complicated way. But, but of course, with modern data visualization and so forth, you can start to, to map, in this case, um, uh, gene family membership or subfamily membership onto this graph and again start to interpret the biology. Related receptors do related things. They have, you know, different views or projections further downstream as you go through this, this assay graph. It could be on the basis of, of differential tissue distribution. Um, so they've got different effects in different tissues, but effectively you have a bifurcation there driven by some, again, some of the, the, the organizing principles of, of you know, the, the genome and, and, and how it's expressed and, and works in the body. Um, here's a nice example where we take um, multiple levels in, the, um, in, in this sort of uh, organization. So, so in the terminal nodes are generally, um, are generally target specific um, assays or, or compounds. And then they converge around a set of common, more functional, deeper, uh, more phenotypic um, functional assays. And of course, all these targets go on and um, are used for the treatment of type 2 uh, diabetes. So the same functional output from different target inputs connected through a set of assays that, that become more similar as you go from gene through to drug. 
Learning decision thresholds is, is remarkably simple. You just look at the distribution of the precursor assay um, uh, set to the, the corresponding projection of that precursor assay set for the compounds that were selected for uh, a downstream assay. And you can start to impute or infer some of the, the decision thresholds that we have happy as a company to be, to be active in a downstream, um, downstream assay. Some of the other stuff that emerges from this um, is that compounds generally become weaker and the, the sort of dose response curve goes from, you know, the, the, it's from the classic logit function, uh, hill slope of one in, in around the IC50 to something softer and, and more um, uh, finessed as, as you move towards more complicated emergent um, phenotypic assays. One of the ways we plan to use this data, once we've assembled it in, in scale and so forth, is to think about a sort of Bayesian network approach. It, again, what are the features of the triggers at each of these nodes that come together to progress a compound towards being a drug? And, and I guess hopefully buried in this, buried in this, um, uh, in this organized directed graph will be pretty general clues to do with cell penetration the activity cliff or, or the difference between a biochemical isolated biochemical assay and a cell-based assay um, first pass metabolism in vivo and exposure effects as you go from a, um, a sort of an ex vivo through to a an animal model um, study as well so so again i think the data is quite well structured in order to allow us to generate or, or ask some pretty deep questions about what are the properties of compounds so uh magda uh, and myself published a paper a, a few years ago um, around analyzing a set of in vivo um, assays. This is a typical, very brief description of um, uh, bioassays in Kemble, but a fairly typical one. Um, within there, buried are yeah, a whole bunch of clues that an expert can sort of think about um, and, uh, and integrate and analyze um, that, that provide prompts um, for uh, data mining and so forth. So, so we've built a dictionary of, of uh, yeah, NER terms, NLP, uh, methods and so forth uh, did parts of speech on this as well allowed us to compare it essentially um, bioassays expressed in slightly different ways um, but what this led to was I, 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 this is um, unpublished uh, work what this led to was a pca of um, the sort of principal components map of all in vivo assays so so you know if you were going to take all in vivo assays that were contained in Kemble and cluster them, what would the map look like? Uh, so this is unsupervised, unlabeled, um, purely based on the semantic similarity of the assay descriptions. And, and we didn't code any, there was no knowledge, it, it didn't know anything about hypertension or, or whatever, it's just literally the sentence similarities. Um, so a, a, new, a new assay comes along, a new, a new um, assay description in Kemble or, or in principle from, uh, from a text source, a paper, and you can project it. You can see where it projects in this um, in this uh, in this space. So, so the greenness of the cell is to do with, I guess, the frequency of occurrence um, in Kemble. Um, and you can start to see tantalizingly in this sort of brain sort of shaped um, uh, sort of cluster that there is some you know richer areas of of uh, of, of bioassay space. So the interesting thing comes when you um, start to label some of these, well, you take the drugs that are tested in those assays and then you, you just annotate them back on this, um, this PCA plot and you start to do some pretty interesting things. So at the top here, um, N03 uh, is just the, the ATC, so, that, so uh, the, the classification scheme for drugs or a classification scheme for drugs for anti-epileptics. Anti-inflammatories are here on the, uh, on the right-hand side of the, uh, of the diagram. Um, Anti-neoplastics generally on the left-hand side. Um, Anti-diabetics in the bottom corner. Anti-hypertensives really a sort of odd set with respect to um, the majority of uh, uh, of, uh, of in vivo assays and, and, and pharmacology. And then a, a disease or, or a you know a, a biological process that's a lot more difficult to describe. You know, analgesia has got a less or a far more diffuse scattering across this in vivo. Um, in this vivo uh, assay space. So hopefully a demonstration that there is some complex latent space type information in the textual description of, of bioassays. 
and there, there is some similarity metric that allows you to start to cluster um, and organize how these assays, how these columns of bioassays at these various levels of biological or biomolecular organization um, actually should be, uh, should be configured. So of course, one of the, the better sources of um, uh, bioassay data is, is from patents. Uh, for example, you know, the, just a description of the, um, uh, of the assays here, uh, pretty easy to pull out these from um, uh, full text structure patent um, data. Group had a fair bit of experience through um, text mining uh, uh, for Shaw Campbell and so forth in this, um, NER, NLP and, and, and so forth. But, but these are the real nuggets, the, the blobs uh, of information that we, uh, that we want to gather and, and, and organize. Um, papers are pretty good as well. Um, so the, this is a, um, a paper, a fairly recent paper, I think, um, uh, where I, I guess people are, are trying to develop new drugs for the treatment of uh, motor neuron disease. You know, there's mention of cellular assays of CK1 delta inhibitors, um, as effect on flies, uh, and so forth. Uh, because my computer interest, I always read that as a, uh, a typo on files, um, which, which just caught me then, but it is flies. Um, and, and here there's another assay, I guess, blood brain barrier penetration, but, but that's to do with the admin, that's to do with the transport, um, the, the, the sort of target engagement aspects, which, although important, aren't really, you know, key to understanding this path between a gene and a, and a clinical trial. Um, the real text, though, is in the, in the back. These are the sort of chunks of, of text that you want to gather. Um, so here you've got a CK1 assay, uh, so an, an enzyme inhibition assay. You've got a cell culture assay here, or a number of cell culture assays. Um, this is a little nub off the side of a, 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 a biochemical assay. I guess you can inhibit an enzyme in many different ways. This is just discovering whether it's competitive, non-competitive, and so forth. So a bit of a sort of dead end on, you know, it's not really um, important for, um, you know, getting a drug from the gene through to the clinic. But, you know, again, you can place it on this network as a little sort of side, um, uh, side stub, maybe. And then here you've got an in vivo um, assay. So this is the, the functional effect and, you know, the test in an animal. Do the flies live longer? Uh, well, do transgenic flies um, uh, live longer when given the, uh, given the compound? So a connection between CK1 delta inhibition, HEC 293 associated um, TDP 43 phosphorylation, and then a Drosophila um, model where TDP 43 is engineered into Drosophila. It's not a natural protein, but you look for its effect on the lifespan of, of flies. So take this on to the, the sort of assay net formalism. You've got a chunk of text um, at this level, a chunk of text at this level, um, TDP phosphorylation HEC 293 cells, and then uh, an in vivo, um, an in vivo assay. And at the moment, we're reducing this to practice by doing large scale text mining in a couple of specific areas of biology where we plan to enumerate this um, sort of directed assay graph between genes and, um, and clinical trials. Um, I like to claim all of this work is myself, but, but that would be a shameless lie and, and loads of loads of people have, have contributed to the thoughts and the data uh, and and the analysis and so forth just really highlight um, uh, Magda, um, you know, who, who did a lot of the, the the in vivo work and some of the formalism around the graphs, the connections and so forth. But here's, um, you know, a subset of the current group at uh, Medicines Discovery Catapult, um, the uh, group, the Kemble group, as was at uh, the EBI, again, um, central to putting this together in some uh, usable form. And then a couple of collaborators uh, working on some things associated with this, which I don't unfortunately have time to, uh, to tell you about today. So, so thanks very much. Uh, let's see, is there any question for John today? Okay, we have one. <clears throat> Anonymous attendee, in terms of years, approximately, what is your prediction of how far away are we from having a virtual human being or a virtual rat being fed a virtual molecule and visualizing in the virtual human being showing its metabolic journey through the body and predicting its drug activity and or its toxicity and excretion from the body? 
that's the first part. There is another question. If or when will Campbell? Well, please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. No. So, so uh, not in my lifetime for the for the first question. Uh, but I am very old and ill. Um, the I for me that's just that that sort of concept again is really seductive, and you can probably come up with some fantastic little graphics that that um, give you an idea that it, it, it will work. But I, I just think, you know, we really struggle with a whole bunch of things. We, we just heard from, from Ola um, about something that, that at face value is a really simple concept. Solubility is actually a remarkably difficult thing when you get under the, under the hood. And, and of course, solubility is, is a, crucial dependent on, a crucial, crucial component on free concentration, partitioning into various body compartments and so forth. And you know, we, we, there's a lot of fundamental, uh, fundamental work still to do. I think, you know, with, there's been huge progress in target prediction. Um, so you know, being able to, you know, classify or rank the likely um, binding partners of a um, of a, a, a drug. Um, uh, but again, it, it's it's too it, it's too sort of messy. I, I worked out, I think, um, of of for target prediction assays by at the current rate i think you know the bioact the 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 data in the public domain was it was like 2055 or, or something we'd have enough data to do reasonable genome scale um bioactivity prediction um and, and that's on twitter i think somewhere um from many years ago second question I, I second think question what well, second part of the first question was if or when will Campbell have a built-in QSAR model so we can do predictions at the web interface, mainly probably for the use by non-computational scientists? How far away are from having QSAR methods being accessible to non-computational medicinal chemists? Uh, well, so, so the so so the, the Campbell um, system is, is to be clear is 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 nothing to do with me at the moment. Um, the I, I philosophically, I think there are, especially for for for, for new users who, who really can't get a you know who probably don't have an inbuilt mistrust of every single number and chemical structure they see. I think it's 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 not good design to have predicted and real data in the same interface yeah you'll need that at some point but i think this yeah having said that of course you know kemble has got things like log d predicted log p and, and so forth um but the you know I, i'm nervous of of mixing especially in a, a an easy to use tool predicted versus um uh, versus actual experimental um experimental data points um, I, I think there's there's already a large number of tools that you can buy that do this, um, yeah, essentially workbenches and, and multi-parameter prediction um, sort of approaches. Uh, they've they've all got their pluses and minuses, um, but but fundamentally there's there's still not enough data to really feed them to to do the whole um, to do the whole whole picture. Um, Okay, we have another one by Nicolas Bosk, who is asking, very nice presentation. How do you deal with assays with different endpoints describing somehow the same phenotype? Example, classification? Yeah, so, so the, um, yeah, I, I get, well, again, a, a really, you know, on the surface, a, a really simple question with an incredibly deep sort of answer. Yeah, we're really bad as a community for describing what active means. You know, everyone talks about active compounds, but of course they're just on a scale and, and defining a boundary for activity is, is, is arbitrary maybe. Um, but what we do know is that given the, the, the dose response curves that we see, albeit that they're on a, a logarithmic um, concentration scale, they do have an inflection point. So there's a small region over which minor differences in bioactivity have big functional output. And then there's, you know, if you've got a potent compound, if it's tenfold less potent or tenfold more potent, it makes no real functional difference to its effect. And same for, for inactive compounds. So you've got this, I think the activity or the interesting thing is, is trying to look at these um, sort of these, these 
inflection points in the concentration effect um, part of the curve. Um, I, again, you know, almost certainly if, if this was a real conference room, there'd be a big, you know, as I say this, but, but I think people fuss a little bit too much about data comparability from these, these sources. Um, if you've got a method that needs, you know, six significant digits on, on, your, on your data um, to be useful in some way, it, it probably is never going to be fit for the, for the real world. Data is noisy and you need robust, um, robust methods. I think, you know, it's possible to do very aggressive data pooling to increase numbers to get um, uh, better, uh, better endpoints. And, and again, you know, transferring, if you're after a classifier model, you know, it's, it's trivial to take, um, you know, a ranked, you know, a numerically ranked list of compounds, start, uh, apply a cutoff and, and just, um, and just process that. But, but I think, you know, I've certainly found in some of the things I've attempted that, you know, merging the same target from different species is a perfectly valid thing to do. Even merging the same receptors from a subfamily is again, a, a pretty valid thing to do, given that the differences in your, um, uh, in your assay data points, so you had let's say five tenfold in terms of potency, which you know in the grand scheme of things, you know are, are beyond the, the current accuracy limits of uh, simulation and prediction and so forth. 